You've probably seen the aftermarket rear screen displays for the Tesla Model 3 and Y. And although there have been big improvements since the first generation, the main questions you might be asking are, is it difficult to install? And is it worth my hard earned money? Well, I'm frugal Tesla guy, and I'm going to help answer those questions for you. Once Tesla released a rear screen display for the Model S and X, the aftermarket companies didn't waste their time waiting to design a version for the Model 3 and Y. Quite honestly, the first two versions were nowhere near what I considered to be worth wasting my time or money with. The first one looked wonky and out of place, and I don't care how well it may have worked, it just looked like a desperate attempt to get something on the market. Now, the second attempt was better, but seemed fairly limited in overall functionality. Now, the third attempt is where I think they finally hit out of the park, at least from the standpoint of aesthetics, but we'll get into the functionality a little later. Now, this video is going to be broken up into three different sections. The first will be the installation, and the second will be a look at some of its features, but this is not going to be a full tutorial because there is a lot to unpack with all of the features. And if there are enough requests, I might do a full tutorial in the future. And finally, my overall thoughts. Now the installation is quite honestly a breeze and I'd venture to say that almost anyone is capable of installing it. First, remove the panel below the AC vent in the back. You may need a tool, but it really isn't all that difficult to release the clips. Now, this next step may seem a little scary, but is actually a lot easier than you'd think. Grab both sides of the rear vent, and with a little extra force, it will release. This was actually very easy, and will be intact in case you ever want to put it back in the future. Next, release the plug and on a side note, yes, I was able to plug both the rear screen display adapter in along with my sexy buttons module without the use of any additional cables. They simply daisy chain off of each other. Now, EV Base will send you two different cables that are clearly marked by the year your Tesla was manufactured. Now, since I have a 2018, I use the cable that was labeled accordingly. Now that said, you won't be able to plug the wrong cable in because it will either be too big or too small for your car. Now once I plugged in the proper cable, I was able to tuck everything into place. Now it will take a little time doing this, but if you're patient and do it properly, it will all fit. And keep in mind, I also had the sexy buttons plug on there as well and still had plenty of room. Finally, the main plug should clip right back into place. Next, you will need to feed the cable you just plugged in up through the bottom and under the vent opening. Now, this will also take a little time and patience, but once you get it through, the difficult part is over. Next, you'll need to plug the proper cables into place. Now, one will power off the screen and tap into the main computer, while the other will give you power to the USB ports. Now, on a side note, you will need an adapter for the USB power cable if you have an older Model 3 before the refresh. But no need to worry, EV Base will supply you with that adapter. Now be sure to tuck all of the cables under the AC vent, and then you're ready to snap it into place. Now you may have to play around with it a little in order to get it lined up, but it should snap in pretty easily. Now, upon plugging it in, it should work off the bat, but if the touch screen is unresponsive, it just needs to be calibrated. Now, to do that, hold all five fingers on the screen until a red cross pops up. Now, tap each one of them, and then you should be good to go. Now, the home screen will have most of the functions that are more commonly used. If the black box with the open car doors is displayed, you will not be able to control anything until you tap the X in the upper right corner of the screen to close the window. Now, sitting front and center are the climate controls. Now, in order for the controls to work, the climate must be turned on from the main screen. Otherwise, it may look like you're controlling the temperature and fan speed, but in reality, you're not. Now, when the climate is turned on, you can turn the rear fan on and off by tapping the power button. Now this will turn it off in the back, but leave it on in the front. 
However, when you adjust the temperature and fan speed, it will also control the front. Now, as of right now, there is no way to change the setting from Celsius to Fahrenheit, but when you do change the temperature, it changes it in the front as well, but it isn't registered on the main screen. The direction of the airflow is actually fixed and can't be adjusted on the screen or manually. However, that being said, there is a very good flow coming out of the vents. Now at the very top is the time. To the left of that is an icon that will take you back to the previous apps or screens you have used. And to the left of that is the home screen button. To the right of the time is the status of the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS. To the right of that is the back button. Everything else on the home screen is pretty much self-explanatory. Now the outside temperature is in Celsius and does match the front screen when converted to Fahrenheit. You can tap the battery icon to check the status of the battery. Media controls are on the far left, which will of course control what is being played on the front screen. On the very bottom are more climate controls, including the heated seats. Now the display is actually a little confusing because based on the image, the seats are facing you meaning you'll have to tap the left seat if you're sitting on the right side and vice versa. Otherwise, they work as expected. Now the fan icon will take you back to the main controls. Tap the seatbelt icon to see which seats need to buckle up, then tap the fan icon again to get back to the main screen. On the far right, there are three buttons, and the only one that works for me is the air conditioning hold button, which will leave the AC on when the driver gets out of the car. The bioweapon defense mode won't work on the Model 3, and mood lights doesn't seem to do anything either. The icon on the bottom left will take you to the different apps that come preloaded with the exception of Amazon Prime Video and HBO Max that I installed from the Play Store. Now you can play music or videos from a thumb drive by plugging it into the USB port labeled with the musical note icon. Then open the respective app to play your videos or music. Unfortunately, I couldn't get either of my two thumb drives to be recognized by my computer so I couldn't test this feature. However, I can honestly say that the preloaded video had better quality than I expected. Settings is where you'll go to connect to Wi-Fi or a hotspot from your phone along with Bluetooth. Now this is also where you'll go to adjust the date and time among several other things. Now there are two steps you'll need to perform in order to connect your iPhone via CarPlay. Number one, connect the rear screen to the car via Bluetooth. Now go to Bluetooth settings on the main screen and start a search. Look for BT966, and the other numbers will actually be different on yours. Next, go to the Bluetooth settings on your phone and look for Car BT. And once it connects, you will have CarPlay on your rear screen. You can now listen to music that will play on the car speakers. Now in CarPlay, you'll be able to skip songs and go back, but to control the volume, we'll actually need to go back to the home screen to adjust the volume and then go back to speed play. Now, since I don't have and never have had an Android device, I can only assume the connection process is the same. Connecting back to Wi-Fi was actually a little tricky for me because whenever I went into settings to turn it on, speed play would eventually overtake the device and turn Wi-Fi off and connect the car to car play. Now, I tried several things and the only thing that worked for me was to turn off Bluetooth on my phone, connect to Wi-Fi, and once it connected, I could go back to my phone and turn Bluetooth back on. Now, you will be able to watch videos on the rear screen while the car is in drive. And if you want to watch streaming videos, it will not connect to the car's cellular data. Instead, you will need to connect to your phone via hotspot if you have that service available. Now, as of right now, you cannot connect the audio via Bluetooth headphones and can only be played through the car speakers. However, EV Base is working on an update that will allow you to connect Bluetooth headphones. For some reason, Netflix and Hulu are not available on the Google Play Store. 
but I was able to download Amazon Prime and HBO Max. Amazon Prime played back videos just fine, but I was only able to get closed captions and audio with no picture from HBO Max. I'm not sure why that's the case, but it didn't work for me. Now, there are a lot of other features that we could go over, but for lack of time, I just think it's best that we kind of stick to the basics. I wanted to start with how this thing looks. If you ask me, it looks OEM and like it came this way from the factory. It doesn't look cheap and really falls in line with the overall feel of the car. Bottom line, it just fits right in. Now, from a technological standpoint, I think they're on the right track. And I say that because it's not perfect. On a scale of one to 10, the touch response is about a seven. There will be times when you need to tap twice to get the response you want, but not to a point where it's a deal breaker, at least for me. It is a little laggy, but just within that level where it's tolerable. Now on the same note, it does take some time for things to load from web pages to online videos. However, once the video is loaded, in my experience, it doesn't glitch or pause, but that will obviously have a lot to do with your Wi-Fi or LTE signal. Now, some might argue that there is too much control for the rear seat passengers, especially if they're children. And that's up for you to decide if you agree with that or not. But having the AC controls in the back just makes sense to me. And because it allows the passengers to adjust it to their liking, and I really like the ability for them to turn on the seat heaters. Media controls are also nice, especially if you have it hooked up to Apple CarPlay, because it will allow them to have access to Apple Music and make selections from the back seat. They'll also be able to use navigation with turn-by-turn -turn directions that will show up on your phone and your Apple Watch if you have one. Now, another thing that I like, and this may be small, but for those of us with the earlier Model 3s before the refresh, it's nice to finally have at least one USB-C type plug incorporated in the car. There have been times when I needed to use a cable in the car only to discover it's USB-C and haven't been able to use those up until now. So is this worth the purchase? Well, if this is something that appeals to you and you've been going back and forth on it, then I don't think you'll be disappointed. The lack of Netflix and Hulu along with the laggy feel may be a deal breaker for some, but overall, I think it's worth it. It may be overkill if you don't have kids or rarely have passengers in the back seat, because those are the people who will be using it. And if there's never anyone back there, then quite honestly, I'd save your money. But if you're in a situation where it will be used regularly, then I say go for it. What are your thoughts? Is this trying too hard to be like our bigger siblings in the Model S and X? Or is it something that Tesla should offer in the first place? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Well, that's going to do it for now. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, and stay positively charged.